as Savior, King, and as Shepherd. Lord, we thank you for this time together. We pray for those who are unable to be here tonight because of illness or whatever other problem may be hindering them. We pray, Lord, that, that it might be removed, that they could be with us again. We thank you, Lord, for this class and this opportunity. We pray all in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> thank you again. By the way, my wife has a sore throat. That's where she is at. So she and the kids are at home. And we've, she is teaching and coaching now in Miller Grove. So we've got a little different schedule than we've ever had. And so, of course, with that comes exposure to all the other children, too. So that's why she is out tonight. Um, we are in, uh, let's pick up in, in 1 Peter chapter 5. Last time we finished up, uh, we didn't finish, but the class ended. And we were discussing Christ and his care as shepherd. So we studied about him for two or three classes. Him, his example of praying, teaching the others to pray when they ask him. And now we're going to talk more about his leadership and what leadership is. What leadership should look like in the local church. Um, and of course, Christ's care as deliverer. His leadership and his care. Christ is the chief shepherd, as we will see, but we will also see that good leadership delegates. Good leadership knows when to delegate. Good leadership knows who to delegate to. And we know as having elders in the congregation, the Lord knows best. So we set criteria for those local shepherds, those local men who would lead us. 1 Peter chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. <clears throat> So I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder, a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. <clears throat> And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to your elders. Clothe yourself, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud, but give great, gives grace to the humble. Of course, the congregation submitting, others submitting to the leadership that God has put in, but ultimately that leadership, that leadership submitting to who? Christ. The ultimate shepherd, Christ, the chief shepherd. So it's critical that we understand it at every level, right? Even those in charge, even the, the CEO, they have someone above them, right? There's always some, everybody has a boss. It doesn't matter how high you are, how high you get, flesh and blood, right? Ultimately, God is in charge of everything. But when we talk about the body of Christ that he built and established and that continues to grow and multiply, locally, he's given men, put men in charge. So he is, Christ is the chief shepherd. He makes, he's given authority. He's made decisions and, and he will come back. So and that is one key feature when we talk about Leadership. Leadership always has an ear to the ground. Now, sometimes it may not seem like it. Bad leadership is disconnected, but good leadership always has an ear to the ground. You see that with Christ over and over. He's, of course, he's God. Yes, he knows exactly what's going on, but in general, they have an ear to the ground. Even if they may step out briefly, but come back, they still know what is going on. And again, they understand when to delegate. Good leadership does this one thing too. They set up a process. You think of what Christ has set up in organizing his church. They, they set up a process and, and delegate it to the right people that it can keep going. Right? Good leadership does that. They delegate to the right people and they set up a process. Even if they're not physically there, maybe they leave for a while. Maybe your boss goes on vacation for a couple of weeks. They're not going to be sitting there thinking, okay, I've left Mitch in charge. Or Ken, Keith, I've left them in charge. What's going to happen while I'm gone? Okay? As elders in the church, there's no way that, you know, 
we've got men doing the right thing, we know that those concerns aren't there. Of course, so much more important. Leading a body of disciples, leading Christians, than being over a few people in the workforce. But again, good leadership sets up a process and delegates to where it can continue to go on, whether they are physically present or not. And the Lord has set up something that that it's it's fireproof, right? It will keep going on until He returns, even if there's just ten or fifteen people serving God. It will continue to go on. So again, that is just a trait of good leadership. Good leadership doesn't put self first. Christ here is called the chief shepherd. We read in Psalm 23, he leads, he protects, the staff and rod come for me, right? So there is that aspect of not putting, not putting your own needs, your own desires first. And honestly, we know that if the Lord had put his own comforts and those things first, then we would not be here if he had put his own physical protection his own comfort first. So good leadership cannot put self first, even even though that may be that may be tempting. That would be the easy thing to do. And again, bad leadership continually will put self first. And and eventually, it really doesn't matter what we're talking about. Bad leadership eventually shows up. It eventually the results of it may take a few years, may take a decade, but eventually bad leadership, whether it's in the workforce or in the local church, it will eventually rear its ugly head. Ezekiel 34, if you would, let's look in Ezekiel 34, and you will see a, a rebuke that the shepherds there of Israel are given. Ezekiel 34. And again, we know these books are very poetic. Lots of metaphors, but the leaders of Israel, the Lord gave them a title. Now, oftentimes the Lord would give someone a title when they really weren't fulfilling it. But again, it was to make a point. Let's look in Ezekiel 34. We talk about poor leadership, misguided, no direction. <clears throat> the word of the Lord came to me, Ezekiel 34, verse 1. Son of man proph prophesied against <clears throat> the shepherds of Israel. Prophesied and say to them, even to the shepherds, Thus says the Lord God, Ah, shepherds of Israel, you've been feeding yourselves. Should not shepherds feed the sheep? So what do we have here? Leadership putting self first. And again, when we're doing this, guys, I always want you to think, this is always in, in contrast to what Christ is doing. Again, this is bad leadership right here. Putting self first. Should not shepherds feed the sheep? Shepherds are entrusted to care. For animals, here they're entrusted to care for the Israelites. You eat fat, you clothe yourself with the wool, you slaughter the fat ones, but you do not feed <clears throat> the sheep. The weak, you have not strengthened. The sick, you have not healed. The injured, you have not bound up. The stray, you have not brought back. The lost, you have not sought. With force and harshness, you have ruled over them. That sounds nothing like Psalm 23. In fact, that's a sharp contrast. He leads me by, you know, peaceful waters, green pastures, staff and rod. No, these men here, and they have understood, they understand, understood flock and shepherding. And you've got the weak. So if the weak, you don't strengthen them, what's going to happen there? They're going to fall away. They're going to fall away and get weaker and weaker and weaker. And we would just say in the end, if nothing changes, they will, they will die. The sick, right? If the shepherds don't take care of them, right? If they're not healed, they will eventually succumb to that. Injury, you've not bound up, right? You've not, you know, back then they probably rode some sort of salve or whatever they would put if the sheep were wounded. You know, now I understand here this is meta metaphorical, figurative. He's talking about the people there, right? The stray you not brought back, the lost you not sought. <clears throat> Let alone they didn't do all that. But here's what's obvious that they have done. <laughs> With force and harshness, you have ruled over them. In John 10, we're going to talk about thieves and robbers. 
Robbers use force. They're violent. They grab and jerk and take. And it sounds more like these guys here. Again, these were supposed to be the leaders of Israel with force and harshness, not tender care, not patience, not looking out for them. And again, with all these people, these scenarios, it was bad. Verse 5 says, so they were scattered. That, that was the end result. Because there was no shepherd, they became food for all the wild beasts. My sheep were scattered. They wandered all over the mountains. And on every high hill, my sheep were scattered over all the face of the earth with none to search or seek for them. No leadership. No shepherds. You, therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of God. <clears throat> As I live, declares the Lord of God, surely because my sheep have become <clears throat> prey, my sheep have become food for all the wild beasts, and so there was no shepherd. And because my shepherds have not served for my sheep, but the shepherds have fed themselves again, leadership just taking care of itself, not looking out for others, not trying to lead anyone. They, they have not fed my sheep. Verse 9, therefore you shepherds hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God, behold, I am against the shepherds, and I will require my sheep at their hand and put a stop to their feeding the sheep. No longer shall the shepherds feed themselves. I will rescue my sheep from their mouths, that they may not be food for them. So when these men weren't doing their job, ultimately, who, who had to step in with strong force and miraculous work and power? God had to step in. He had to step in and take care of, of this problem here. Again, something so great that's been, that's been delegated. And an aspect I want to discuss a, about, about leadership um, is that leadership is not a position for the novice, for someone that's new. Right? It's, scripture says, you know, elders can't be, you know, recent converts. Oh, it has to be somebody with experience. And, and we don't put people, and maybe you've seen this done in the workforce, you don't put people in a position of leadership so that that will make them a leader. That generally doesn't work. So rarely will somebody be put in that position. Anybody that's in a leadership position has demonstrated it. And again, qualifications for elders is people who have, faithful men who have been consistent, who have demonstrated that over a period of time. Consistency. Because that's what the sheep need. The flock needs consistency. Wavering doesn't help. That's what the men in Ezekiel 34. That, that's wavering. And really just at the end, probably just trying to save their own skin is really what it sounds like there. <clears throat> but absolutely. Um, can't be new to it. They have to have courage. They have to be strong. But what I would say is we think about Christ as chief shepherd, even going back to Abraham. The Lord did not appoint men all the time many times over doing great things without first letting them have some stewardship. Abraham. Abraham had what? Servants. He had so many animals. He had lots of possessions. Um, in some of his dealings with kings, he left them with what? Did he leave some of those encounters with more or less? You think of Abraham. A lot of times he left with more, more possessions. So again, that was God's powerful hand granting those to him. But Abraham was going to be a man to, to start to start the nation, to start Israel. And again, great promises were made to him. So again, he was granted stewardship. He was granted that. And for the most part, he showed good leadership. And those who were under his charge. Again, so many people and so many possessions and animals. Who else in the Old Testament? Maybe just a few verse, a few verses, a few chapters up in the book of Genesis. Who was also taking care of his uncles, animals, and business in the book of Genesis? Sir? Okay, there was a lot. And I'm thinking a little I'm thinking a little further forward, sorry. Jacob. A little further forward. He went to find a wife. Jacob. Okay, there we go. Somebody said it. Jacob, right? And who was who was his uncle who's taking care of their stuff? Laban. Laban, that's exactly right. 
Jacob and Laban. In Genesis <clears throat> chapter 30, uh, in verse 26, Jacob said uh, to Laban, he said, Give me my wives and my children for whom I have served you that I may go. <laughs> you know the service that I have given you. He's taking care of the things that Laban's given. He's been a good steward. But Laban said to him, If I have found favor in your sight, I have learned by divination that the Lord has blessed me because of you. And the key, the key to Laban's success was not Laban and some sort of great uh, breeding process that he had or some sort of scientific formula for his herd. No, it was because of God. It was God <clears throat> through Jacob doing this. Name your wages and I will give it, verse 28. Jacob said to him, You yourself know how I have served you and how your livestock has fared with me. Again, stewardship, taking care of the flock. Again, rarely men are given more and more without their leadership being assessed by God. Now sometimes, in Scripture, God put people over things and they didn't do a good job. Again, we just read that in Ezekiel 34. But these men continue to demonstrate that. Now, let's put forward to 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel, we think about Shepherd, the writer of Psalm 23. 1 <clears throat> Samuel chapter 16. The leadership, the, the courage, and in a little more detail here um, about taking care of those things. From who? Who was the one who was the young shepherd boy? David. It was David. Yeah. David had that position too. 1 Samuel 16, 3 verses 14. Now the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and a harmful spirit from the Lord tormented him. So Saul's servant said to him, Behold now, a harmful spirit from God is tormenting you. Let our Lord now command your servants here before you. Go seek a man who's skilled in playing my beer. And when the harmful spirit from God is upon you, he will play it and it will be well. Verse 17, so Saul said to his servants, Provide for me a man who can play well and bring him to me. One of the young men answered, Behold, I have seen the son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite, who is skillful in playing, a man of valor, a man of war, proven in speech, and a man of good presence, and the Lord is with him. Therefore Saul sent messengers to Jesse and said, Send me David your son, who is with the sheep. He's with the ship, with the sheep, yeah. taking care of those things. Shepherding, doing the work of a shepherd. Jesse took a donkey laden of bread and the skin of wine and young goat, sent them by David to his son. Sent them by David to his son, his son to Saul. And David came to Saul and in his service. Saul loved him greatly, and became his armor bearer. And Saul said to Jesse, saying, Let David remain in my service, for he has found favor in my sight. Whenever the humble spirit from God was upon Saul, David took the lyre and played it with his hands. So Saul was refreshed. And was well, and humble spirit departed from him. Even young David, he had intuition. Right? He was aware of what was going on. He saw what was going on. He had skill and talent that God had given him. But he had already had present. He had already had practice taking care of something that didn't directly belong to him. And as king, anybody in position of authority, a lot of times you're taking care of something that maybe didn't cost you much. Right? You've been appointed into that position. You may not have sacrificed much for it. No, when you get to be leader, leader over them, you're going to work hard. But ultimately, you might not have purchased that. Again, God was going to take, to take this man and make him great. Now, let's look in 17 briefly about the shepherding work. Uh, in 1 Samuel 17, about the shepherding work, that he mentions, and this comes in a little more of, of, the, con of the context here. 1 Samuel 17, 31. When the words David spoke were heard, they repeated them before Saul, and he sent for him. And David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Who was him? Goliath. Yeah, yeah. 
You're scared. Your servant will go out and fight with this Philistine. And Saul said to David, You're not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are but a youth. He has been a man of war from his youth. But David said to Saul, Your servant used to keep sheep for his father. Saul, before I was with you, you remember what I did. Kept the sheep for my father. And when there came a lion or a bear or a lamb and took a lamb from the flock, I went after him and struck him and delivered it out of his mouth. Again, the care, the delivering care of a shepherd, that work there. I delivered him. And after I went and struck him, delivered out of his mouth. And if he rose against me, I caught him by the beard and struck him and killed him. So even to protect the flock, using all necessary force, as we would see. Your servant struck down both lions and bears, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them. Now, would it be normal today for a regular man to kill a lion or a bear? No, and it was no different back then. It was the power of God that allowed him to do that. For he has defied the armies of the living God. So he's saying, I'm going to take a stand because, because of what he has said about the God that I care about, the God that he took a stand for. And David said, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion, from the paw of the bear, will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, go, and the Lord be with you. Now, I don't know how convinced there Saul was <laughs> of what was going to happen. We know that um, there was wavering times sometimes from him, but... But this is leadership stepping up, right? Leadership is not ignorant of the dangers. Leadership is not ignorant of the challenges around them. Just like elders here, they're aware of the dangers, the threats. But when a challenge comes, what does leadership do? Take care of business. Step up and take care of business. They take charge, right? Before, maybe there wasn't the urgency for a plan, but now in your circumstance, there is. And with the Lord's church, yes, he's always continually leading and delivering. So again, what David did and became king over Israel. He was their shepherd and so many other offices for Israel as well. So again, just a few words there as we talk about leadership. Again, leadership takes care a over those in their charge, again, that they may or may not have worked hard for. So let's look in John chapter 10. John chapter 10, where we now have the, the chief shepherd, the ultimate one on the scene. Again, if Christ is king, he's our king, if he is our savior, then he has to be our shepherd. And again, as our shepherd, we have to be willing to be led. We have to be willing to be led by him. We have to put aside our pride. Because if he's about to continue a conversation in chapter 10 that he started with a group of men who had lots of pride, who did not acknowledge Christ as the Messiah. They said he was not God. And in fact, in John chapter 9, these Pharisees, they call Christ everything but God. Everything but the one we should follow and lead. Again, in John chapter 9, the context here, again, we get into chapter 10. This is just a continuation. And the chapter breaks, remember, were put in there by men. I really think when you read chapter 9 here, you should just continue right on into 10. But in John chapter 9, what event just happened? He healed a man that couldn't see. That's right. He healed a man that could not see. And there was lots of questions about it. Uh, one, it was done on the what? Sabbath. It was done on the Sabbath. And that was always a fixation. Oh, you broke the Sabbath. This can't be God. This can't be someone from God. Um, verse 16, John 9, 16. Some of the Pharisees said, This man's not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. And continue in there, but others said, how can a man who is a sinner, and, and probably relating back to their claim of him breaking the Sabbath, how can someone who is a sinner do such a sign, <laughs> calling Christ a sinner? Uh, and again, they called him many other things. 
And verse 31, they said, We know that God does not listen to sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, God listens to him. Again, they're very pessimistic and questioning about this circumstance here. But the Lord has something to say directly to them about authority, about those who should care, about leadership, about danger, and really about their own sin and their blindness. Let's read John chapter 10, and we'll read the first 18 verses. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter, by, enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, this man is a thief and a robber. Verse 2, but he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens, the sheep hear his voice, he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them. And the sheep, what do the sheep do? They follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. Again, he told them, you know, now that you still see, your guilt remains. They didn't understand it. So he goes on. Jesus again said to them, verse 7, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved, and I will go in. And we'll go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd, verse 11. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd who does not own the sheep sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf snatches them. <clears throat> The wolf snatches them and he scatters them. He flees because he's a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I'm the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. And I have other sheep who are not of this fold. I must bring them also and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason, the Father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down. Of my own accord, I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. Again, the chief shepherd here discussing the ultimate sacrifice that he was going to provide to protect all of humanity. Not from lions and bears, but Satan himself. The stain of sin, the guilt of sin, the power of sin, only Christ was going to be able to overcome that. When we think of safety, safety of the fold. Verse 1, truly I say to you, he does not enter by the sheepfold, but by the door climbs in by another way. This man is a thief and robber. <clears throat> the sheepfold, they had these rock-type structures, kind of a one-way-in, one-way-out, at least from the pictures I have seen. And that was there to protect the sheep. And did they just leave the door open, nobody there? Mm -mm. No. They would oftentimes, a shepherd, maybe he needed a break, and he would hire somebody. Again, usually they did not own the sheep, they had very little invested in these animals. And they would hire somebody to watch it. But you think of the safety in the fold. There is truly safety in Christ. I tell you, we had an incident in Emory Saturday night. Our tongue is familiar with it. A man escaped the county jail. And this wasn't just any man. Okay, this guy was a no-bond. He'd been in there for over a week, for attempted murder. So this was not just somebody, but this guy got on the loose and spent probably over 24 hours in Rains County running around in the woods before they finally got him. Now, we were a little uneasy 
until we found out exactly where they thought this guy actually was. And then we could kind of kind of take a break. But the police got on Facebook over and over for all the people in that area saying, do not go outside. This guy's dangerous. Don't, don't confront him. You know, I felt safe in my house. That was about it until we really figured out where the guy was at. And, and with Christ, there, there's only safety in Christ because it really is danger. It is danger otherwise because what happens when you're outside of that fold? What, what are you exposed to as we see here at the end of chapter 1, at the end of verse 1? Is it someone of good character? It's evil. Evil, absolutely. A thief and a robber. Now, there has never been a good connotation with thief and robber today or then. No. Somebody climbs in some other way trying to break in. Got to be careful. Okay, but there's only one way in. And again, the doorkeeper, the protector of that, but he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. Identification, right? It's Christ identify himself. The shepherd would identify himself to their sheep. They would be familiar with him. We only, we only become more familiar with Christ through what? Study, worship, growing, attending Bible class. He's given us so many opportunities as his flock to continue to grow, to grow in him, continue to Verse 3, to him the gatekeeper opens. <clears throat> the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. So why would they need to leave in that instance to go out? <clears throat> Those sheep. They heard the voice of the shepherd. Yep. They were called. They, they understood. They recognized the voice. Right? But there were probably also maybe physical needs. Right? eat, water, those sorts of things. They couldn't just keep them cooped up. So there was an inherent risk when they got out of that rock structure, that safe structure. There was an inherent risk getting out of there. But they were protected. There was protection from the shepherd. Now Christ, he's, he's leading us out, but he's with us. So what is he leading us to do? We talk about Christ. Leadership. Just name a few things. Follow him. Okay. Follow him, right? Because nothing will be right if we don't follow the right leader, right? We don't follow the shepherd, yes. John chapter 9, <clears throat> the young man that was born blind, all mm -hmm. he did was tell the truth. Yeah. And I think that's a remarkable quality that Christians should possess that doesn't matter what happens they always follow the truth and <clears throat> guess who is truth what is truth mm -hmm. it's the lord right he's always the lord absolutely and the guy in john chapter 9 he took a pretty he took a big risk so much so his parents recognized it because they feared the, the religious leaders of that day and they're like we're going to let him deal with this on his own we don't want to deal with it. We're scared of getting, you know, uh, disbanded or, you know, kicked out of the synagogue or whatever it was that they feared. They absolutely feared that. So, yes, this guy took a risk. Yeah. But as we go out and we tell others the truth, we take a stand for the truth, the Lord is with us. He, he's still leading us. He doesn't just say, get on out there, leave, this, leave the sheepfold here. And I'm going to stay in here. I'm going to stay in the shade. I'm going to rest and relax. Again, if your director or your boss at work did that all the time, you would say that is poor leadership over and over and over. So no, the Lord doesn't just kick us out. He leads them out. He leads them out. He goes before them. Come on. Come on. And yes, it's a, it's a dangerous, it can be a dangerous, scary world. But we have a shepherd with us. We have to follow him too. That's it. By the word. Right. And he's left us his word. Yeah, it's, it's pretty interesting back, back in chapter 9 because in verse 30 it says, The man answered and said to them, Well, 
Here is an amazing thing that you do not know where he is from, and yet he opened my eyes. Yeah. He was blind. Right. And he sees much better than they do. And, it's, yeah. and then and then at the end of the chapter, they, you know, Jesus accuses them because they can't hear his voice. Mm-hmm. And then he goes into chapter 10 and says, My sheep follow me because they hear my voice. And let me show you, and again, remember, this right here, I mean, it doesn't say he sat Peter down in the twelve. He's still speaking to those Pharisees. He's explaining to them, okay, here, here is what you're doing wrong, right? Here's your your weakness. Here's the flaws and what you've been doing and how you've been living and all that. He points it out. He continues with this contrast, explaining who he is and explaining who they are clearly, whether they thought they fooled Christ or not. He clearly explains to them who they are. But again, yeah, these guys were supposed to be the intelligent ones, right? The elitists, they were supposed to know everything, right? There were poor leaders. They were blind leaders. That's why they're only unable to even recognize who is even before them because they're not willing to be led. They don't want to be led. They're not wanting anything to do with Christ. Christ tries to give them a little better illustration. Verse 6 says he uses this, the figure of speech or this illustration. You know, and it's it's a pretty clear illustration. But they still did not understand what he was saying, the scripture says there. So again, he Christ does, he calls us out, he leads us out, and again, good leadership, they don't just call you out, they just don't get you set up to succeed. They just don't give you safety and then say, okay, bye-bye. Okay, the Lord, with the 12 in particular, he told them over and over, I'm going to send you the helper, the comforter, the Holy Spirit. I will not physically be here. You won't see me physically anymore, but I'm still with you. I'm still leading you and delivering you. And I've left you my word. Again, we have the word so that through faith, obedience, we can continue what the Lord started. Again, that is good leadership. Setting up something that whether they are physically there, it can still go on because it's delegated to the right people. To people who will listen and are willing to be led. Again, sheep who will listen and be led out by Christ versus the thief and the robber. Again, the robber, the violent, the thief, you know, thieves, they come out on the bride of day and trying to break in your house usually. It's not right now, but normally. Normally it's not. It's covered with secrecy, right? That's, that's how Satan works. He, he works, you know, we might say a covert operation here. That's how Satan works. And a lot of times that's how he works. Again, he's just telling these guys, hey, you guys really are, y'all are really the thieves and the robbers. Okay, here's who I am. And you got really kind of three different, four different groups. You got the shepherd, the sheep, and the thieves and the robbers. You got all these different characters here that he is describing in this illustration. Verse 7. Verse 7. Truly, truly, I say to you, he said again, I am the door of the sheep. So to get to the sheep, to harm them, so he's, he's the shepherd first, and there he let, let someone be the gatekeeper. But to get to the sheep now, what's, what is the thief and the robber going to have to do? Go through the door. They have to go through the door. Saying, okay, you're going to have to come through the door to get to the sheep. Okay? These guys did not stand a chance fighting against God. Okay? And ultimately, the thief, Satan, he does not stand a chance. And trying to come after the world, he's got the world. For, for those that are obedient, we have the strength of Christ. Again, we have his leadership. The staff and rod comfort us. That protection, he continues with. He protects us. He's the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door, verse 9. If anyone hears by me, he will be saved. We'll go in and out and find pasture. Right now, stressing to these guys, well, we know salvation, being rescued, 
Find the chief shepherd. Obedience. But you have to come through that door. It's, and it, it's described as a pretty narrow way in Matthew 7 and other places. It's, it, the path to eternity can be narrow. But again, he even gives that opportunity to these people. If anyone enters by me, any of you guys, any of you Pharisees, if you're willing to repent, <clears throat> Again, these were people that I guarantee the 12 weren't willing to deal with them. So Christ would. He would face them head on. Again, as the protective shepherd. He will be saved. will go in and out and find pasture. Again, think of green pastures. Life sustained. Not just physical life here. We're talking about spiritually being sustained by God. Okay, not, not a drought, not dry pasture, not a place with no water where nothing can survive. No, we're talking about living. Because we're serving the true and living God. So the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy, verse 10. Satan has one result. It's one goal. And it is always to kill and destroy. It's not to bite you a little. It's not to scratch you a little. It's to finish you off. And that's the goal every time. But the chief shepherd, his goal every time is to lead, protect, and deliver. Every single time. That never changes. We are willing to be led. Because again, Satan is coming. He only does one thing. He says, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Chief shepherd, leading them, leading the sheep to return to anyone who would come. We're going to pick up in verse 11 next time. I'm the good shepherd. So if you want to read 11 through 18 again, next time we're going to wrap up a little more here in John chapter 10. Thank you for your questions and comments tonight. <clears throat>